it, it, it troubles me because I think this stuff is rich, uh, that physics is feeding back and that ultimately a model of consciousness will come out of studying the, the deeper levels of the behavior of matter. But the conclusions are all going to support the non-scientific, non-rational factions. In other words, Bell non-locality is real. All matter in the universe is in contact with all other matter through some kind of higher space based on their original connectivity. Quantum teleportation is a possibility. Uh, these violations, backward flowing time and violations of, of rational casuistry are all real. In other words, Science, meaning physics at this point, prosecuted its agenda of deconstructing nature to the point where it let loose the elves of madness, paradox, contradiction, and peculiarity. And that can now never be put back. I mean, the dirty little secret is that at bedrock, the universe is more like a DMT flash than it is like an 18th century garden party, as we were previously assured by the practitioners of science. Uh, so I think that's enough ranting on that subject. Yeah. Thanks for being patient. So it seems crazy to me to have, you know, violent factions for 2012 and then the, I mean, the point is, that something, the galactic mind, the, the, the intelligence of the species, the integrated Gaian and galactic entelechy, something is trying to deliver a message. And it is writ large, this message, in our largest systems of defining and understanding time. Uh, we are at the end of a cosmic cycle. You can say a thousand years if you're a Gregorianist, or you can say a 5,300x year cycle if you're a Mayanist, or you can say a 26,000 year cycle if you're a Processionist. But the point is, we are, we are there. We are there, we are in parking orbit around the eschaton. Uh, and you know, it permeates our lives. All you have to do is sit down, smoke a bomber, and look, and it's there. You know, it, it is pregnant. We are pregnant with this eschatological breakthrough. And, you know, people want it to arrive in the form of ships the size of Manitoba hovering over the Oval Office, uh, <laughs> perhaps offering oral sex, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and, but you see, we are, we are such ephemeral creatures in time, we're like mayflies or something, mayflies who only live for seven days. Uh, in other words, our temporal window perception is so extreme. I mean, people say, well, nothing much ever seems to happen. Well, a hundred years ago, there were no movies, automobiles, airplanes, telephones, internet, atom bombs, antibiotics, DNA, it's endless. So in the space of, and yet people say, well, nothing much ever seems to happen. You know, An incredible ability to not register radical change seems to be a precondition of existing in the presence of uh, radical change. Uh, the second thing which science has taken on board, uh, has refused to take on board, is that this process of complexification that I just described to you, as you approach the place in time called the present, happens faster and faster. That was not necessarily implied by the first observation. The first observation was simply that there was a process which was moving from simple to complex. Now we have the concept of a process which is ever accelerating as it moves from the simple to the complex. So uh, more and more happens as you approach the present. And since these processes have been running since the Big Bang, 
there is no argument to be entertained that they will reverse themselves suddenly. No, they're not going to reverse themselves after 13 billion years. Duh. <laughs> so, uh, so then, but the implication of that carried to its ultimate extreme leads to a conclusion most people find too wild to entertain. If the universe is evolving deeper and deeper into complexity, faster and faster, and if now in a human lifetime we can see a small portion of this curve, it no longer appears flat to us because of our nearness in relation, you understand what I'm saying? That we can actually discern the curve. And so that means, I believe, that by extrapolating this process, we should then logically conclude that we are very near, relative to the life of the universe, we are very near to the place where this ramping up of complexity will become so excruciatingly rapid that more change will happen in a single week than happened in the previous 13 billion years. And that then there will come a moment where more will happen in a single minute than happened in the previous 13 billion. And then a moment will come when more will happen in, in 6.55 times 10 to the uh, 23rd uh, erg seconds. More will happen than has happened. And people say, well, but that's crazy. I mean, how, what kind of universe is that? That ramp, that... <laughs> well, wait a minute. What's so crazy about this? Let's look at what the competition is peddling. <laughs> but what the competition would have you believe is that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment for no reason. Well, now, whatever you think about that theory, in the interest of being awake, please notice that that is the limit case for credulity. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean that if you can believe that, you can believe anything. That is the most improbable proposition the human mind can conceive of. I challenge you to top it. You know, I mean, I know the Scientologists think God is a clam on another planet, but I don't think that tops this idea. <laughs> that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment for no reason. That is the art, that's article of faith number one. I say, no, no. This, this, if we're talking about universes that spring from nothing, if we're, if we're going to talk like that, then surely such universes occur in a situation of great complexity. In other words, if we're going to look for an enormous eruption of emergent phenomena, an enormous, sudden, unexpected download of novelty, we shouldn't look in a domain of zero space, zero time, zero energy, zero anti-entropic organization. That's the worst place to look. That's the least likely place where such a singularity would, be, would spring out. Where should you look? If you believe in this jabberwock, this chimera, this particular beast, where should you hunt this snark? You should hunt it in domains of immense complexity where you have matter, energy, light, chemistry, language, machines, people, cultures, intentionality, minds, minds, minds. And if you throw all that stuff together and shake it up, it's maybe not a sure thing that you will get a singularity, but you're certainly betting right. You Now you've figured it out. So I, I think that uh, science is, is extremely hostile to the idea that the universe is complexifying and complexifying more and more rapidly. Why? It's just a matter, it's just a historical issue. 
It has to do with the fact that 19th century English biology was extremely hostile to what it called deism. Deism was the reigning religious paradigm of the 19th century, and it's the idea that God is a clockmaker, and that God made the universe and wound it up like a clock and went away. And it, what <coughs> irked those, what irked Darwin and Lyell and those people was the idea that the universe has a purpose. You see, they thought that if it has a purpose, this somehow means there is a God. And they weren't up for that. Uh, they were trying to build rational science into a tool for understanding nature. I think we have grown beyond that. And that's a, it's foolish to wear those tight 19th century high button shoes. We can believe that the universe is following an organizational vector. We can believe that the universe is under the influence of a strange attractor. We can believe that the universe is pulled toward a future uh, denouement, as well as pushed by the unfolding of causal necessity. We can believe all of that without evoking the 19th century concept of God. Now, why do I spend so much time on this? And you know, what, what's so great about all this? Here's what's so great about all this. If you, if you will join me in this belief that the universe works as I have described, it's an engine for the generation of complexity, and it preserves complexity, <clears throat> and it builds on complexity to ever higher levels. If you entertain this, guess what happens? It's like a light comes on on the human condition. Who are we in my story? Well, first let me tell you, who are we in science's story? We are nobody. We are lucky to be here. We are a cosmic accident. We exist on an ordinary star <coughs> at the edge of, an, of a typical galaxy in an ordinary part of space and time. And essentially, our existence is without meaning, or you have to perform one of those existential pate dues where you confer meaning, or you know, one of these postmodern you know, soft shoes. <laughs> but if I'm right, that the universe has an appetite for novelty, then we are the apple of its eye suddenly cosmic purpose is restored to us. We left the center of the cosmic stage in the 13th century and haven't been back since. But this idea says, no, people matter. You are the cutting edge of a 13 billion year old process of defining novelty. Your acts matter. Your thoughts matter. Your, your purpose to add to the complexity, your enemy, disorder, entropy, stupidity, and tastelessness. Uh, and, and so suddenly then, you know, you have a morality, you have an ethical arrow, you have contextualization in the processes of nature, you have meaning, you have authenticity, you have hope. You have the cancellation of existentialism and positivism and all that late 20th century crapola that people used to uh, entertain back in the old days. So uh, that's why I uh, am so keen for the idea of novelty, because it seems self-evident. Uh, and, you know, we can argue about whether the eschaton will arrive uh, in 2000 or 2012 or 3,000, but I cannot believe that there is anybody in this room tonight who can, that the hardest thing to imagine is human history going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more years. That's impossible. We, have, we see around us the processes that make of history a self-limited game. The clock's ticking, folks. 
You think we can do gene splicing and internet and psychedelic <coughs> drugs and manipulation of our genetic material and star flight and atom uh, uh, antimatter and uh, uh, quantum teleportation and all these things? You can extrapolate that 500 years into the future? Don't be ridiculous. No, history is some kind of a phase transition. It only lasts about 25,000 years. Some people think that's a long time. Some people think it's a short time. It depends on where you stand. I think of it as snap. You know, one moment you're hunting uh, ungulates on the plains of Africa, and the next moment you're hurling a gold deuterium super conducting extra stellar device toward Alpha Centauri with all of mankind aboard in virtual space being run as a simulation in circuitry. <laughs> you know? It's just first the one thing, then the other thing. Uh, but now history, which lasts 25,000 years, is this weird period where you're neither fish nor fowl. You know, you're not the hunting ape anymore, but you are not yet the 16-dimensional digital god, you know. And, and in that transition phase, there is confusion, there is uh, angst. But now we're at the end. We have no, I, I maintain anybody who's peddling angst and peddling pessimism and peddling all this stuff is just that so two minutes ago. <laughs> Question. <laughs> I, I heard you on the radio uh, being interviewed a while back, talking about uh, it's DMT. Is that the that is? <laughs> and um, that got me really interested. And uh, you, you you said that it was basically unavailable from me. <laughs> well, is that your question? No. <laughs> Close. Pardon me? No, I, I was really wondering, um, yeah, I, I had interpreted that you had said it was pretty much unavailable, period, and I was wondering if, if in fact, it was available, and um, if not, I mean, that just sort of renewed my interest in psychedelics, um, which now you think is the second best choice? Well, first let me say, because it's an... And I'd like to hear maybe just a little more about... Um, about DMT. Oh, okay. Well, first thing let me say, which is a piece of practical advice, um, the psychedelic community is, is cleverly invisible. Because our choices in gender expression, fashion, so forth and so on, have by crypto osmosis come to dominate the values of the culture, we can no longer tell ourselves from from straight people. <laughs> so uh, the only opportunity where we really come out of the woodwork is a thing like this. And, but then, of course, there's a tendency to fall into old think, and everybody focus on the alpha male spielmeister at the front of the room. Uh, so let me point out to you, I'm leaving, I'm going home to Hawaii tomorrow morning, but this is your community. This is your community. And whatever it is that you think you need, there are a dozen people in this room who can help you out. <laughs> And I am not one of them, because <laughs> I have a different assignment. But look around, and, and of course, be careful. Uh, but after all, this is about consciousness, right? I mean, if you're not conscious enough to uh, uh, conduct that social 
transaction without flubbing it up, <laughs> that's probably God's way of telling you you shouldn't be proceeding toward high doses anyway. Um, yeah. Oh, and you wanted me to say more about it. The black and red poncho. <laughs> the man in the black and red poncho. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in, in a way, it's impossible to talk about DMT, but on the other hand, it's fun to try to talk about it because <laughs> it pushes it pushes the horse of language into a lather. <laughs> Basically, when you smoke DMT, what happens is pure confoundment. And, you know, I'm trying to speak generally here in the sense that different people are confounded by different things. So, of course, it addresses you personally. Your, your level and tolerance for confoundment is a very uh, personal thing. Uh, people have asked me about DMT. Is it dangerous? And the real answer is only if you fear death by astonishment. <laughs> You know, and you deliver that line and then people laugh, except the people who've done DMT don't laugh. <laughs> because they understand, you know, death by astonishment is no remote possibility. Uh, death by astonishment is right there. Uh, you know, when was the last time you were astonished? Uh, it's, unless I smoke DMT, it doesn't happen to me. Amazed occasionally. Astonished? Never. Astonishment is when your jaw hangs for a long time. <laughs> you know? And DMT is, is simply confounding. Now, how could something be that confounding? I mean, you can imagine taking a drug and realizing that you should treat your partner better or realizing that God really exists or realizing that you should exercise more or <laughs> realizing that the planet is an organized intelligence. But, but how could something be as confounding as DMT is? Uh, well, I think the answer to that, and it took me a while to get to this, is that the reason it's so confounding is because it, its, its impact is on the, the language forming capacity itself. So the reason it's so confounding is because the thing which is trying to look at the DMT is, because, is infected by it, it, by it, by the process of inspection. So DMT does not provide an experience which you analyze. Nothing so tidy goes on. The, the, the syntactical machinery of description undergoes some kind of hyperdimensional inflation instantly. And, and then, you know, you, you, you cannot tell yourself what it is that you understand. In other words, what DMT does can't be downloaded into as low dimensional a language as English. And so you're, you're like, I remember a B movie I saw when I was a kid and it was set somewhere in Mexico and there was a big swamp and there was a dinosaur in the swamp and at one point this, uh, this campesino comes, who encounters the dinosaur comes rushing out of the swamp and the, Patron of the ranch is there, and this terrified guy is there in the serape, and he can only point to the forest and sort of make a croaking sound, and uh, and 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 that's what English allows you to do uh, with the experience of DMT. You just come down a sputtering mess. If it if it works, you just come down saying, you know, my. God, you know, it's not what I thought it was. And this is after you've done it 20 times. It's not what I thought it was. It's not what I can think it is. It, 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 it's something, and I, to me, it's a miracle because my intellectual 
arrow and how I brought myself up in terms of all these things was I am a rationalist and I am interesting, interested in testing and verifying and proceeding to define truth by non-exotic means. In other words, no archangels, no none of that. Uh, and and as I as I matured intellectually, I began to eliminate mystery from the world. You know, I'd look into some spiritual discipline, conclude, no, that's a bunch of crap. I'd go to some teacher, conclude, no, this guy is a weasel. I I tested, I, I sought the weird, but with an attitude of critical skepticism. And I assumed blithely that with this flashlight I would soon prove there were no elves in, out there in the darkness. Turns out, no, no. This is the way to proceed. Because stuff which is malarkey will be exposed as malarkey. Instantly, you know, you just go to the guru and say, what can I, what can you show me? And if the guy wants you to sweep up around the ashram for a dozen years or so, you say, no, I'm out of here. Uh, but when you get to DMT, it delivers. It delivers. It is as strange as anything can be. It is, you know, it is not only stranger than you suppose, as you sit here, it is stranger than you can suppose. And what makes me wild about this is we're not talking about something that you have to go 500 miles up a jungle river and live with primitive people and study techniques for 30 years. and control. We're talking about something which if I had a pipe loaded with it in my hand, each one of you would be 30 seconds away from what I'm talking about. Well, you know, you've tripped and yeah, you lived in Paris and you went to Trebizond and all these things, but nothing like this ever descended. But it's not, it's not, it, it's so near. You know, it's not attained by practicing tantric techniques or building up mon It's none of that. It's just near, very near. One toke away is this absolutely reality-dissolving, category-reconstructing, mind-boggling possibility. And I feel like this is a truth that has to be told. I'm like the campesino running out of the swamp and saying, you know, over here, you know, the orange thing. Uh, do, do that. Thank you very, very much.